Another indication that not all Americans shared the Industrial Revolution's materialistic development ethos were the proliferation of utopian communities, which is the subject of this a bit longer uh, video. Many people in the 19th century America believed that you know, a perfect society was imminent, uh, a utopia was imminent, about to spring forth from the, na the nation's unique geography. The logic went something like this. The old feudal villages of Europe enjoyed close human relations, but their living conditions were terrible because barren material necessities were always scarce. It was too easy to freeze or starve to death, be killed in warfare, or simply die from a bad diet and overwork. Now, at the other extreme, modern industrial society, it pulled people away from family ties and face-to-face -face relationships and made them cogs in an impersonal factories run for crass material gain only. So, in contrast, a utopian community would provide for a combination of human needs that included material security, community participation, and personal self-fulfillment. This could only arise, it was believed, in the unique American landscape, the pastoral landscape, free from both urbanization and total wilderness. So America was a perfect place to have these utopian communities. Removing oneself from the center of civilization allowed for the development of an ideal society free from constraints. One of the most famous of the utopian communities was known as Brook Farm in West Roxbury, Massachusetts. Brook Farm was a transcendentalist commune where the transcendentalists sought to free themselves from an industrial society that they believed kept them from their full development of their mind. It was founded by a Unitarian minister named George Ripley in 1841. Brook Farm lasted only five years until 1846, but in this time it was a vibrant, exciting place to live. Nathaniel Hawthorne lived there while Emerson visited. There was a lot of music and dancing, games, plays, parties, picnics, dramatic readings, and so forth. The problem was that but it really wasn't economically self-sufficient. It appealed mostly to well-to-do Boston families who were Unitarians and who sought alternatives to being uh, just devoted to the acquisition of more and more wealth. Few artisans or farmers joined, and as you know, transcendentalist Ripley and his followers spent little time, you know, trying to work or organize. Obviously, they they weren't providing sufficiently for their material necessities. The result was that after a fire in 1846, they just decided to give up and sell the farm. Another famous communal experiment was the Shaker Movement. It was a millennial sect with roots in England and France, and it, it came to the U.S. in the 1700s. They were called Shakers because of their ecstatic dances and movements during their religious ceremonies. The Shakers believed that an 18th century English woman immigrant named Anne Lee was the incarnation and in the second coming of Christ. Because Ann Lee spoke of lust and greed as a source of human corruption, the Shakers believed that they must withdraw from the world and uh, follow to follow Christ. Beginning in New York, the Shakers founded a number of communes. M most of them were in New England. The most successful were during the 1830s and 1840s when they attracted over 3,000 converts. They pledged to abstain from sex, alcohol, tobacco, politics, and so forth, and they had to declare themselves, quote, sick of sin and undergo a confession process that could go on for years. The Shakers believed that God was a dual person, both male and female, and thus Anne Lee was the uh, female side of God, Jesus was the male side, and they tried to banish all distinctions between the sexes. They had a, a high structured community life, you know, they they did well because they were very self-sufficient in production and sale of farm produce, and they were very good crafts makers. But, you know, they eventually died out. I think it's kind of obvious. They did, some of them lasted at the beginning of the 20th century, but when you're saying that uh, you're abstaining from, from sex and, and alcohol and tobacco and politics and, and you're not reproducing your next generation of followers, it's probably no wonder that it eventually died out. Another communal experiment was in many ways quite different from the Shakers, the Oneida community in Oneida, New York. The Oneida community was founded by a man named John Humphrey Noyes in 1848. Noyes had been a, uh, born in Vermont in 1811 and had been a minister, teacher, businessman, and even been a member of the United States House of Representatives. The uh, 
Oneida community believed in the doctrine of complex marriage, which meant that all members of the community were married to each other. The goal was to gain community control over sexuality, and they saw the solution as sex with multiple partners, but without male ejaculation. Childbearing was and child rearing was strictly regulated by the community with children raised solely in uh, community nurseries. And the idea was that women were free from being regarded as the property of husbands and children were free, free from being regarded as the property of parents. Overall, this was to promote an idea of uh, the communal experience. By the 1850s, more than 200 people lived in the United community but it remained financially insecure until a highly successful businessman joined just before the Civil War. The man had made his money making steel animal traps and he turned the profits simply over to the Nida community. Now eventually, when the money began to run out, the Nida community began to go downhill in the 1870s and always ended up fleeing to Canada after being charged with adultery. In 1881, its members founded a company, the Nida Community Limited, which survived into the early 20th century. The most successful of all the communal uh, utopian type experiments in the antebellum age, and both in terms of attracting followers and protecting itself from uh, all the surrounding society, was the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, which of course still exists today and goes by the name, uh, the, uh, people go by the name of the Mormons. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded by Joseph Smith who believed that God had singled him out for a special revelation of divine truth. God had called him to be a, a prophet with a message for redeeming a sinful society flawed by excessive individualism in the Industrial Revolution. In 1830, Smith published his revelations as the Book of Mormon, which he claimed had been translated from ancient hieroglyphics on gold plates shown to him by an angel, an angel named Moroni. Smith therefore organized a church that would assert control over almost all aspects of life in order to assure a communal life that God intended. Smith adopted many of the traits popularized by the Industrial Revolution, hard work, saving, risk taking, and so forth. But Smith also imposed a communal framework that concentrated power in the church elders. The Mormon church grew quickly. By 1840, Smith had over 30,000 followers. However, the demands of the religion and their hostility to other sects, and also, you know, most notably their success in attracting converts, worried other people. Wherever, whenever the Mormons showed up, it worried them, and it built up a lot of resentment that often boiled over into persecution of the Mormons. This persecution got worse when the Mormons settled in Nauvoo, Illinois. It was about then that uh, Smith announced that he'd had another revelation one that God encouraged polygamy. And a polygamy, of course, was the idea that a man could have multiple wives. The Illinois community locked up Smith, and even worse, an anti-Mormon mob stormed the jail, killing him, and sort of making him a, model, a martyr, rather, to his followers. Smith's leadership was taken over by an early convert, Brigham Young. Young had resolved that the Mormons could only survive by leaving the United States and going west into the wilderness. Beginning in 1846, Young began a phased migration of more than 10,000 people across the Great Plains into what then was Mexican territory. Of course, two years later, it became part of the United States. Eventually, the Mormons settled by the Great Salt Lake, which is now in the Utah territory. And here you can see the Mormon Trail from uh, Nauvoo all the way out to the Great Salt Lake. Hard working, the uh, Mormons built a pretty tremendous temple and they built an impressive system of irrigation that really transformed the desert into productive farmland. The community thrived with their emphasis on working together and despite the problems of a growing number of non-Mormon settlers into the area, it, uh, it really began to even think of uh, becoming a, uh, a, a Mormon state. And it, in the 1850s, it even petitioned the Congress to have a Mormon state called Deseret, which would stretch all the way from about San Diego, L.A. area, all the way in through Utah. In their proposed state of Deseret, the Mormons even planned to develop their own alphabet. Now, 
Congress wasn't going to have it. In the 1850s, they rejected the Mormon petition. But they did agree to a new Utah territory with Brigham Young, the territorial governor. However, you know, in 1857, 1858, due to political pressure, President James Buchanan removed Young from the governorship. And, and a Mormons really almost, you know, almost revolted, uh, had like a near war with Mormons, and Buchanan eventually backed down. The Mormons kept polygamy as one of their doctrines until 1890, and it was only then uh, that, you know, the U.S. government began to consider Utah as a, uh, a state, and it was granted uh, six years later. This concludes the, uh, the rather long video on the utopian communities that grew out of the early Industrial Revolution.